briefly uh, to give you an overview of the session today. Um, I will be your MC. Uh, we have one hour and we will go through um, just a brief overview, like, you know, a refresher, why we're doing this on cooling, um, what was the background on, on, on this pledge and what is in the pledge. Uh, that'll be with myself and Mikhail, uh, then I think will be accompanied by our colleagues also from the UAE, uh, uh, Rama El-Shamsi, who will come in and discuss also how we can, how you can join the pledge. And Sophie will then come in on the launch details. You'll have a Q&A, so you can ask some questions. Uh, I think that's going to be enabled through a chat due to the, the net large number of people in the call. And then that'll be followed by... Um, in introduction to the other sections of the pledge, which is on subnational commitments and industry commitments, um, followed by another round of Q and A. Um, so that I think is is the plan for today. And um, please do uh, put your questions in the chat uh, because that's the whole point of the call today is to really uh, answer your questions. Um, so with that, I'll just start. Um, Maybe. Just yeah, before sorry. you start, uh, yeah, before you start, Lily, I just, I hope that everyone can hear us now. I think there's some technical issues on some fronts, I hope, that will be sorted out soon. I just wanted to, yeah, quickly introduce myself as well. So, me, Kyle Melin, with the COP28 Energy Transition Team, and I've been the focal point on the cooling uh, agenda for the presidency. And uh, obviously working um, with many, many colleagues, including uh, Dr. Sultan, on this priority theme and topic and the Global Cooling Pledge, which is a product of this close collaboration with UNEP and the Cool Coalition and many of member states too who have contributed substantial time and effort in making sure that we now have a text that we're all feeling uh, quite confident in getting buy-in for. So, uh, so that's something that uh, I'm very happy to be uh, discussing more with you today. So I'll mute there, and uh, as Lily said, indeed, my colleague uh, Rahmal Shamsi will be joining us a bit later uh, in the session and also give uh, some perspectives on the cooling agenda from the UAE side, and then uh, also a few words about the importance and the opportunity for us all to make sure that cooling was on top of the agenda at COP28 in Dubai in a matter of a uh, few weeks from now. So thanks, Lily. Over to you. Thank you, Mikael, and uh, um, uh, apologies for not handing over earlier. So, um, um, so I will just have a quick refresher. Most of you are very much familiar with cooling, but just in case, as I know we have some new people joining us today, just to remind ourselves, what is why are we doing this on cooling and what is cooling? I mean, obviously, we think often about cooling as thermal comfort um, and, and how we can keep cool in an increasingly hot world. But cooling is much more than thermal comfort. It's also about the resilience of our food systems and keeping food fresh and accessible through cold chains. It's about the rapidly growing stock of uh, buildings and neighborhoods um, that are uh, poorly designed or devoid of nature. Um, it's about our healthcare systems. Of course, cooling is important for keeping our vaccines viable. It's an energy problem. Cooling is the second largest uh, um, driver of demand for electricity after industry, constraining our, our power grids. It's about prosperity, uh, enabling us to work and learn in healthy and safe environments. And at its core, it's about climate justice. Um, the poor and the most vulnerable are often the hardest hit by temperatures and are the least prepared. Um, but as the irony of it is, is that the more we're cooling ourselves, the more we're heating the planet. And um, uh, that's a challenge we're trying to address. Is it me controlling the slides? Next slide, please. Yeah, thank you. So um, cooling is a double burden when it comes to climate change. It consumes a lot of electricity thanks to inefficient air conditioners and poorly designed buildings. Um, but cooling also uses refrigerants, which can be uh, significantly more potent than CO2. And um, the sector represents 7% of emissions today. So if we don't change the way we deliver cooling, emissions will be growing dramatically from 7% that we have today. Uh, next slide, please. Um, just typically, uh, just to say cooling has been uh, very much tackled 
uh, through the Montreal Protocol from the refrigerants perspective that some of you are familiar with and separately as energy efficiency a bit and a bit on the built environment. But it's not really been um, tackled comprehensively and holistically as one joint uh, effort. And that's why it's been often referred to as a blind spot. I think the IEA said that a blind spot in the energy and climate discussions. Uh, and as a result, we see the science is siloed, the policy is siloed, and it's not driving the comprehensive response we need um, across uh, refrigerants, energy, uh, and the built environment. Finance has not been sufficiently directed to the issue, and 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 there's a lack of preparedness for the challenge that's coming, um, that we're facing today and is coming. Next slide, please. So recognizing this, just to give the background, this is why in 2019, several of you who are on the call today, governments, industry organizations came together with UNEP to launch the coalition, Cool Coalition, and the goal was really to take comprehensive action on cooling um, and uh, help countries to do that and industry and therefore deliver on Paris Agreement, Montreal Protocol and the SDGs together. And this was then um, recognized as a transformative initiative also at the Climate Action Summit. Now, uh, next slide. That is why also UNEP and the COP28 presidency um, partnered, uh, the COP28 presidency recognizing these gaps and recognizing the key role that co uh, cooling plays in mitigation adaptation, um, uh, uh, asked to come together with the, with the Cool Coalition, all of you, and to, to drive some transformative action um, on cooling towards COP that will deliver on these three uh, areas of action. Um, so uh, what, what you are here to, what you'll hear about today is the Global Cooling Pledge, which was an outcome of that collaboration, um, and it is currently listed as one of the nine key non-negotiated outcomes of the COP28 presidential action agenda, which Mikhail has been driving forward. Um, next slide, please. So just to say what we're trying to do with the pledge, because the question comes sometimes, you know, why a pledge? What is it trying to achieve? Um, it's really about looking at how to bend the growing cooling, uh, the, 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 how to bend the curve. Cooling demand is growing significantly. Um, and the pledge looks at bending the curve by concentrating efforts on downward pressure. So looking at passive measures to reduce demand in cooling, looking at increasing energy efficiency um, and looking at uh, uh, faster phase down of, of HFCs where possible. Sorry, uh, it's click, click. <laughs> you could click. Thank you. Uh, and so the pledge uh, comes to delivering on um, increased access to cooling services. Please click. Uh, increasing uh, climate resilience and lowering um, energy demand and emissions. It's a bit of a picture of the of the pledge. Next slide, please. So um, the process of the pledge, what has been undertaken over one year, is consultations um, that COP28 presidency led with uh, various um, uh, jointly with uh, UNEP on uh, at various fora to discuss with countries and non-state actors um, the text. So there's a consultation on the text. What you see here are all the, all, at least over 40 countries were consulted and more than 100 non-state actors. And this uh, started in um, at, on the sideline of the IRENA assembly in January and culminated in January 2023 and culminated at the um, G20 uh, energy ministerial uh, uh, SEM uh, event um, where um, the COP28 president um, came and made a call to countries um, to join the pledge. And and um, and after that, the early supporters of the pledge, next slide, um, came together in what uh, COP28 presidency led, which was a contact group of partners who wanted to then um, finalize the or negotiate the text based on what has had been consulted upon uh, over the year. And maybe I can hand over to you, um, Mikhail, if you want to give a few more details on the contact group and, and then the actual pledge content um, that, uh, that was dis discussed in this group. Thank you, Lilia. Thank you for that introductory presentation. And as we've heard, yes, it's, it's about the planet. It's about people, but it's also about prosperity. And this really is the right moment for us now to, to make sure that this lands on top of the agenda uh, at COP28. So picking up from where you landed here in the presentation, Lily, 
indeed. Uh, I think it was in July where the pledge text was already in, in good shape. I mean, I think we had a lot of ingredients to make uh, a uh, to put together a pledge which we're going to come to in the next few slides. But what we needed to ensure was um, that the text was finalized, tightened up, and that all the fact checks that you'll see in the pledge that has been shared with you were verified, confirmed, and then uh, packaged in that pledge that you have uh, in your inboxes. So this obviously took some time and some effort um, and uh, consultations, not only uh, within the contact group. I think we had at the end 13 dedicated sessions to discuss the text and the various aspects of it. We also had uh, external experts come and present the latest data and evidence uh, from, from uh, and on cooling. And then that indeed is the product that you now uh, see in front of you. In parallel, we obviously have been reaching out <coughs> to member states, subnationals, non-state actors, private sector, in the many uh, climate weeks that have taken place uh, across the globe. This includes the one in Nairobi, the Africa Climate Summit. This includes, uh, among others, the Latin American Caribbean Climate Week in Panama. And this side event certainly has confirmed well, the importance uh, and the interest uh, for this topic as a whole. Now, uh, obviously, the consultations and the outreach continue sorry, from the COP. Sorry, Mikael, yeah. the, the team should go to the next slide, please, so that you can see the pledge, actually. There you go. Oh, thanks. Thanks, Lily. Yeah, so obviously, um, in addition to uh, the contact group, in addition to the side events, the main events, the key speeches that Dr. Sultan and, uh, and the team has been delivering across this year, uh, obviously continue and we continue reaching out to all countries, uh, small, medium sized and large, and obviously hope that this momentum also resonates with them so that we will get a uh, broad based buy in. And what we would aim for is to have many, many countries, 100 countries sign up and endorse this pledge and be part of this launch moment on the 5th of December. So basically coming to the pledge, text itself, the first part speaks, the preamble part, the first page speaks about the importance of cooling across the agendas. And that's what Lily presented to you earlier. And what you have here is then the commitment parts to the text, where initially now we've been focusing on getting the national governments onboarded and endorsing this pledge. Having said that, obviously, all the other partners, be it subnational, regional governments, cities, non-state actors, private sector, were all being called to come in and help implement this pledge. Uh, later on the agenda, we're also going to have dedicated presentations on, on how that looks like and how we're going to also be integrating some of the commitments from the subnationals and other partners into the main uh, body of the text and then what we obviously want to do is also then bring all this uh, this collaboration together and see how do we not only bring this pledge over the line launch it successfully but then very much focus on implementing it so i'm not sure that i'm going to go into all the details uh, about what we have what we propose here in the global cooling pledge uh, that the countries would commit to, but I wanted to highlight a few elements there. I mean, certainly the ratification of the Kigali Amendment is a key component on this agenda. Uh, through that, we can tackle a lot and we can tackle, amongst others, then the cooling related emissions. The commitments also speak about the need for massive improvements in energy efficiency. It speaks about the importance of buildings. It speaks about committing to passive cooling solutions, nature-based solutions. It also speaks to the 1.1 billion people that don't have access to cooling. It speaks to the need to including that as part of this uh, pledge too. It also speaks about research. It speaks about innovation. It speaks about national action. It speaks about international collaboration. 
it speaks about financing, it speaks about all these things in an integral manner, and that's the text that you see on your screen. Which is a bit too small for me to see, but I hope you see it better. Anyway, so maybe they... Perfect. So I'll pause there and there's going to be opportunity to have questions and we can come back to the to the text and uh, provide the clarifications. But perhaps uh, before we before we uh, proceed on the agenda, perhaps I'll say a few words about about the pledge and the process, given that we only have a few weeks left. So the outreach, obviously, as I mentioned, has happened through various channels, through diplomatic channels, through group channels, through bilateral outreach. And what you see on this slide here is the process uh, for signing up and endorsing this pledge. And this is really quite simple. Uh, an endorsement letter can be sent to Dr. Sultan with Anne Inger Andersen, the executive director of UNEP, or to one of them. And um, for ease of monitoring and follow ups, copy it to myself and uh, Lily, uh, both on the screen here. And uh, if there was any questions you had on the official endorsement or the process, we can take those uh, questions as well uh, in the Q&A uh, part later. As mentioned uh, already by Lily, we're going to have a big main stage launch event on the 5th of December. We're also planning a number of other events around the cooling agenda across the program across the World Climate Action Summit, across the Cities Day, across the Energy Day, Nature Day, Finance Day. So the cooling is going to be a cross-cutting team, really across uh, the COP28's program. But uh, already drawing your attention and wishing for uh, big numbers to participate, obviously, for the launch event uh, itself on the 5th of December. I'll stop there, uh, Lily, and uh, perhaps uh, we can jump to the next slide and see what we have there. Just wanted to, yeah, I think just as uh, that was a Q&A session. Um, but yeah, I think in the in the if you could. Be, yeah, I think to just to re-emphasize the joining process, because there's been a lot of questions, as Mikael said, just, you know, it's. Um, yeah, that's, that's the question people ask on the endorsement process. So it's it's really stating a, um, a letter having a your writing on your letterhead. Uh, a, a letter, as Mikhail said, that's addressed to COP28 presidency and that indicates that you endorse, that you support, that you join the pledge. That is that is the that is the thing for um, and then requires that you indicate a point of follow up, um, point of contact for follow up. So that's the main thing for member states, I think, for um non-state actors joining the pledge i mean though there's specific things that have been discussed for industry and for cities but more broadly i think uh for you know uh non-state actors that don't fall in those categories it's the same process but you will really fall into the category of non-state actors who support who commit to support the signatories of the pledge that's there's a sentence in the pledge saying that so there you would be indicating i whatever organization you know, uh, in, endorse the pledge, and 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 will support you know the signatories in by sharing knowledge or through whatever financing institution. If it's a finance institution, through some kind of funds or through um, capacity building. If you're a you know a, an I O international organization or whatever it is that you you can do to support the implementation of the pledge. Um, so it, just if you can go back for a minute, Deepa, to the yeah. sentence that indic that calls on people to join to slide before Deepa, please. Um, so in this blue second to last sentence is the one that calls on non-state actors to help support the implementation of the pledge. So for non-state actors sending this letter, it's really saying, I support the pledge and we'll do that through X activities. Yeah, that you that you're doing. So that's yeah. thank, thanks, Lilia, uh, for that. I see, and uh, I see. There's questions, and maybe maybe if we come to that segment next now, and uh, I'm going to try to look for them in the chat box as well. But please do use the Q and A button. I think there's one on the at the top bar where you can put in the questions 
then we'll find them. But I see there's a question from Moritz Weber. And uh, what's the cutoff date for endorsing in time for launch at COP28? So what we are very keen, obviously, in having is having the endorsements as soon as possible and uh, build off the good momentum we have. Uh, now, there has been a cutoff date indicated, which is the 29th of November. So that would be the answer, uh, Moritz, to your question, 29th of November. But uh, as mentioned earlier, if possible, to make sure that we uh, make the most uh, of it and be able to also plan for the event uh, on the 5th. On what the event launch event will be, so certainly, I mean, we will have the, the leadership from COP28, Dr. Sultan, uh, We'll have Inger Anders, an executive director. We're also reaching out uh, with letters of invitations that are going to be going out very soon to ministers. We're also um, in discussions with the subnationals and the city group to have and spotlight actions that are being taken at the city level. We're also looking into how we bring in the uh, finance element into that segment, uh, the launch event itself. And then really to make it powerful, the plan is also to be able to spotlight best practices, early actions that are already on the way uh, on cooling. So it's going to be uh, an event that the nuts and bolts are currently being uh, looked at. And we, we hope to be able to communicate all those details to you in the, in the coming days uh, next week uh, for sure. There was a question in, there's a question uh, there in the Q&A, uh, Lily, for you, perhaps, if you might be able uh, best to respond to the question on elaborating a bit more on the rationale for 68% of 2022 levels. Mm. Um, so, um, there's, uh, so the UN environment, UNEP, uh, actually uh, is going to be releasing a, uh, a report, a uh, flagship report that's been developed this year, which for the first time, which was a collective effort with the cooling community. So it had many of the people here, including uh, Ozone Secretariat, and Multilateral Fund, uh, to the Montreal Protocol, um, I don't know, IRENA, SE for All, um, IEA, RMI, I don't know, I mean, many, many, many people, over 50 scientists and, and, and experts in the community contributing. IFC will bank. Um, so it was a collective product and um, several universities, etc. And the idea was to come together and fill a gap in the cooling space in terms of knowledge, which was that there's not been a, an, a, a real understanding of the totality of emissions from the cooling sector uh, across indirect and direct emissions. So emissions from refrigerants and emissions from energy use um, across all sectors. So transport, uh, uh, industry, uh, space cooling, process cooling, cold chain, etc. So the whole um, sector. So, and what would it mean for um, countries? How could we get on a net near zero emissions pathway? So that modeling was done. Um, looking, using a, a maybe not going into too much detail, but using a very robust model model that has that's based on. 30 years of um, cooling data, um, and uh, which is, is it's from uh, Ray Gluckman and had an advisory group. That modeling undertaken then showed that you we can achieve a 68% reduction from emissions, uh, from cooling emissions um, that are put by 2050 uh, against the baseline, against business as usual, uh, through three key measures. And that is the um, um, reduction of demand through passive measures. So that includes, you know, natural shading, uh, uh, smart buildings, nature-based solutions, etc. Um, improvement of energy efficiency, um, of course, of equipment and operations, um, and uh, a faster action on HFC phase down. So those three actions get us to sixty-eight percent reduction now, because cooling is very dependent on energy. Uh, countries would have to decarbonize the grid to get to near zero emissions by 2050. So the 68% does, uh, is looking at these three actions and tells us that as a cooling sector, by doing these things, we can get to 68% reduction. 
that was a long, uh, long yeah. uh, explanation, but I thought it's important to be very clear. Please ask any more questions about it. Thank you. Lily, while I respond to some of the other questions, if you can look at the Q&A uh, question that I posted from Electrolux. Uh, good Qu question from Martin Hildebrand. When will the pledge be addressed, signed at COP? So what the process is indeed is that we're seeking these endorsements prior to COP so that the launch event would already have uh, the partners on board and spotlighted that have endorsed this uh, pledge and the launch will be on the 5th of December. There was a question about uh, about cooling events during COP and so here again the UNEP team uh, and Clement, I believe, uh, is keeping good track of those. And I think um, that list of cooling related events, be it in the green zone, the blue zone, or the various pavilions, uh, will be shared uh, in the coming week or so. Okay. Just because I think two people have asked me, they didn't understand the third action from the three actions. So, that, sorry for the 68%. I just I just wanted to respond to that. And, the three actions are reduction of demand through passive measures and and smart buildings, et cetera. So redu demand reduction through passive measures. Second is, and that includes also in cold chain, you can use passive measures also in cold chain. And the second is uh, energy efficiency, improvement of technologies and operations. And the third is faster if countries take uh, faster action to phase down HFCs. So these were the three um, scenarios. And for each of them, you'll see a uh, different uh, pathway. Uh, but those three taken together achieve a 68% reduction. I hope that that's clear, uh, Anna. And, and maybe, yeah, I'm also question. thinking maybe in the chat box if there was a, a bit of a write up to that point, given that it seems to be a lot of questions around it, that could be good. Okay, all right. Okay. Um, uh, one also on the communications I, on comms, Mikhail, I think Sophie's, Sophie's supposed to give us an overview of that at some point, so maybe that can excellent. be parked for a minute. Perfect. Good. Uh, so uh, here's a question from Etiosa. Yeah, at this point, yes, what we're really um, aiming for securing is, is uh, endorsements from national governments, while it's certainly calling for all the other partners to help with the implementation. And then in parallel, as mentioned, there's a subnational section uh, and there's a team uh, that are helping uh, figure out what that powerful commitment and plans of action would look like. Yes, so yes. more on that, more on that shortly. There was that question from Electrolux, uh, Lily, for you. There's a question from Sasan from Iran how to encourage governments that have cheap fossil fuels to use clean energy? Yeah, that's a, obviously a good question too. I mean, I think the short answer would be because it makes a lot of sense for, for the planet and for the people and for prosperity. It is uh, increasingly becoming the most uh, affordable and sustainable, also financially, solution to, to generate power from and that married then with energy efficiency across the board uh, would help certainly make the case for a clean energy transition as a whole of which cooling as highlighted by Lily is, is an important part of that equation given that it's the number two second driver of demand. So just to uh, clarify on collective targets, so two things that are important to clarify here. These targets have been negotiated by governments. So um, they've discussed these in detail and come to what was what made sense for them um, through, I think, 13 sessions that Mikhail led, uh, COP28 team led um, with governments um, two hours each. So so there's there's been a lot of discussion on the the details of the targets and they've been sort of written out in a way that that made sense for them. Um, um, and so the, the the collective target was one that governments really wanted to make clear what it meant for them. So I understand that there's questions on what it means. Uh, the collective target of the um, air conditioning one that you asked about. Um, from Electrolux was one that is from the IEA's net zero scenario. 
and it says that so if you if you reach if you i don't know if clement you've shared the whole pledge everybody should have the preamble but there's a preamble that explains the ia's net zero scenario and says countries have different starting points but that the collective global average of installed capacity of air conditioners needs to needs to be increased by 50 percent so by putting that in the preamble, governments wanted to make it clear that there is a different starting point for different markets in terms of some are already above 50 percent, some are far less. But that this is the ambition uh, that, that to to properly achieve to achieve a net zero world, there's a need to to in double the efficiency of installed capacity of um, air conditioning equipment. So that's the point on the collective target for air conditioners. Uh, and so that's the. If you look at the preamble, you'll see that that's the pretext. Um, and then same for the 68%, it's a it's a global target. It's not applied on a country by country basis. It's an, a global ambition for countries to work towards. It's not going to be applied as a per GDP um, basis. On, and, and countries clarified that by saying the, fo the following sentence, which says each country will achieve this through their individual like uh, existing ongoing activities and through collaboration and etc so that's sort of a preface saying that this was much more about we work as globally multilaterally to help each other to try to achieve this global reduction um yes so i hope that answers the question i don't know michael if you want to add to yeah. anything i've said no i think thanks lily for that i'm keeping one eye at the time as well i wanted to transition to sophie uh and maybe so if you introduce yourself first and you can um, answer some questions on the on the cop and the comms and the advocacy Thanks. side. Over to you, Sophie. Thanks, Michael. So, I mean, I, I guess people know me, but my name is Sophie. I'm the Global Lead for Communication Advocacy at UNEP for Climate Action. And I'm also supporting the Co Coalition on Communication and Advocacy. Um, I mean, I saw a couple of questions in the chat regarding the launch of a report and how the day will, will be organized. So just wanted to say that we're going to start the, the day with a press conference to um, announce the Global Cooling Pledge uh, to the media, but also uh, the Global Cooling Stock Tech report um, with um, Inger and, and a few others like um, high-level representatives uh, that, that have been invited to join this press conference. On the 5th of December launch event for the moment, like the timing is not fully set. But um, I hope to be able to get back to you uh, by Monday with the final uh, timing of the event. It's going to for sure happen in the afternoon uh, and probably like late afternoon. But we are still like figuring out the details, including like the run of show and so on. But really the idea is to make sure that all the um, different stakeholders are represented during this uh, event. So it would be government, uh, cities, representatives invited as well. Uh, to be on stage, but also the private sector um, uh, representative, because I think we just want to make sure that, that 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 it reflects the engagement that we have with a uh, different stakeholder. Um, together with uh, SE Forall and Climate Work Foundation, uh, we are working on a set of uh, key messages and uh, FAQ on, on cooling, but also on the global cooling pledge that I think would be useful for uh, partners to have ahead of the launch of the pledge. There are some assets that are being put together, including like a, a video, uh, one on the report, one on the uh, pledge, a set of social uh, media cards that are um, reflecting the key messages from the report, uh, but also uh, for the global cooling pledge. Um, on top of that, we will have a, a media advisory that uh, will go out um, uh, mid next week uh, to media to announce the press conference. Uh, and the launch event. Um, in addition to that, we will be releasing on the 5th of uh, December a, a press release from uh, UNEP COP28 UAE uh, the site, sorry. But we invite you to, of course, like use this material. Uh, you'll be able to use it and then tweak it to, to be able to uh, answer your, your quote and then share with your own like networks. And um, yeah, that's pretty much uh, in a nutshell what we are working on with the uh, uh, communication uh, working group uh, from the Co Coalition. And uh, hopefully, I'll be able to share by email all this uh, asset by end of uh, uh, next week. I'm not sure if I see additional 
question here. Um, I think there was also a question on the different events uh, that are linked to cooling, um, mm. not only on the 5th of December. So Clément is putting together like a, a, a tracker that uh, if you, Clément, if you can post it on the chat, yeah. uh, where we are inviting all the partners to also flag the events that they are organizing on cooling. I mean, we know that those on Secretariat is, is super active with uh, a pavilion, but but uh, I also know that the colleagues from sc 4 and others are organizing uh, different type of event. There will be a district cooling summit organized uh, by IDA and Empower. Uh, so a lot of things happening and, and, and we are trying to keep track of all the events on cooling, like using the tracker. Um, I think yeah, that, I, that's, that's it from my side. Well, Michael, do you have a question for me? <laughs> no, no, I think, no, 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 that's great. Uh, I think that there's, uh, yeah, no, it's good to hear. And uh, we're very happy that there's a lot happening for sure. And, uh, and more of those details that will be shared. Looking at the time, and I see uh, we have Graham on the agenda next, uh, speaking about the subnationals, uh, the commitments, and the plans of action. Uh, Graham, uh, would you want to go next? And we will then take some more questions uh, uh, towards the end of the session. Thanks. Thanks, Mikhail. And uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everyone. I'm, I'm Graham Maidman. I'm from the UK government. First of all, I wanted to say what a fantastic achievement this is to get this to this stage. So well done to the UAE and UNEP, the core coalition in, in developing this. It's absolutely brilliant. Well done. Um, I've had a role in um, looking at how subnational governments can, can work on this. And um, the backdrop to this is... Um, Subnational governments, so cities, municip municip municipalities, local authorities are critical if we're going to if we're going to decarbonize our, our cities, our urban areas um, and um, cooling and how we deliver sustainable cooling in these cities is going to be critical um, to that in, in a warming world. Um, on the one hand, we have um, climate change in cities and urban areas will disproportionately um, be impactful due to the urban heat island effect. And, and on the other hand, um, cities are really influential in the, in reducing carbon emissions in, in their areas. Um, directly, they, they influence about 5% of all emissions, but indirectly, um, they, they influence um, the the areas emissions. So all the other people and, and buildings and 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 users of of that city, um, they influence their emissions through planning, through advocacy, through procurement, and other things. So we see cities as being really important in in this piece. So what we've done is we've been working together with a group of city networks and some cities to really um, develop. Um, three areas of um, the uh, subnational commitment. And you can see these are here. The first one is about having a, a strategy for um, delivering sustainable cooling um, it, it, within the, the, the local authority or the municipality um, policy. The second one is about making sure we, we benefit from the use of um, nature-based solutions. So make sure we, we've got a, a focus on, on green and blue spaces in those are, areas. And the third one is about leading by example. So um, having public procurement that is focused on the best that we can get, the best technologies we can get using low GWP refrigerants and high efficiency technologies. And what we've done, this is these 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 are these are still being uh, uh, finalised and be interested in, in your input from, from this group. But the idea is at the moment um, that uh, local authorities will sign up to one of one or more of these three it could could sign up to to all three. Um, um, but but anyway, we've got our email addresses there. Feel free to input to us um, if you've got any suggestions, etc. Um, yeah, I'm going to stop there and hand back to to Michael um, for for questions, etc. Thanks a lot, uh, Graham, and thanks a lot um, also to the UK for being such an active member in the contact group and he helping make this a reality now. So. so that's good. I'm looking at the agenda and we have the industry commitments to the global cooling pledge. And uh, Andrea Voigt, I think, was 
not able to join this morning session now, but I'm wondering, Lily, would you want to say a few words about uh, about what's being discussed in the industry grouping? Or we leave it? I yeah, I mean, I've really, let, I've really let the, 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 the private sector has been leading this themselves, so I've uh, not tracked it. I'm happy to read what's here. Um, I know that the group of um, companies have been discussing this pledge. Um, and if any of you from the group are here, maybe you can jump in to give your feedback on on how this has been put forward. Um, but I think the main thing is the science-based targets that are supposed to be put in place um, as a commitment um, by 2024, looking at uh, reporting on scope three emissions. Which I think is 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 a good important one, um, and then specifically to support um, particular aspects of uh, pledge implementation. So, uh, looking at um, supporting uh, procurement practices, uh, supporting building codes, and supporting policy implementation that update infrastructure necessary for decarbonized cold chain. Next slide. Um, improving uh, refrigerant management and energy efficiency, uh, leak reduction, installation and maintenance practices through training of service technicians um, and uh, public reporting of um, scope one and two and use of scope three emissions towards the target of the pledge. Um, so that's been some of the things that the contact group has come up with on the industry side of the commitments. And I know there's been a few people there, I think Train, Danfoss, um, EIA, um, and WWF and others that have been in that group. Um, so please, please come forward. And I know that IDEA is also working on mobilization of pledges on district cooling. So I should say that this one blanket statement that I that we showed in the pledge, if you can please go back to that for a minute, um, deep out on the slide, there's this one blanket statement that says everybody's welcome to support. I think that is also open if, you know, um, industry wants to make very particular commitments, like we're going to support countries by launching this initiative or by doing X or Y. That is also still open and welcome beyond the industry pledge, I would say. I don't know, Mikhail, you want to add to that? So thanks, Lily, for uh, jumping in on these two slides. I'm just wondering, and I'm going to have my colleague Rahma join very soon, but there was a question as well, uh, I think it, uh, from Sasan, that there is no cooling working group in Iran's environmental organization. And so I'm wondering, um, Lily, there, maybe you could say a few words just about, about uh, UNEP, your team, and the cool coalition as a whole in terms of... Uh, being also a technical partner for the countries in helping. Uh, yes, of course, of course. Yes, yeah. so 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 um, uh, we are happy to provide support through um, Cool Coalition members and the various technical groups that the members are leading um, to countries. The whole point of the coalition was to support um, this comprehensive action, as mentioned, we have over 130 members, we have many country members, and um, the idea is that there's various working groups on specific topics. So, for example, topics that are proposed by governments or topics that are proposed by different members that are that need help and support. And then uh, the um, Cool Coalition Secretariat supports those working groups uh, and there's co-chairs and then produces technical guidance. Um, uh, jointly agreed uh, uh, model, I don't know, model guidance, model codes um, can provide capacity building. It's, ver it's very broad. Um, so we have, for example, nine working groups at the moment. Um, national cooling action plans is one which really helps with countries to provide a coordination platform for um, bringing together uh, cooling across different ministries. So sometimes cooling is hidden in different ministries' actions and, and national cooling action plans can help with that in response to Iran's question about not having it explicitly uh, placed in the ministry. Um, so th that's one group, but there's many others that we have on the various aspects. Um, and also for the pledge, uh, the, the coalition through its through its uh, partners will be supporting countries with uh, implementation of various commitments. So. 
Um, Thanks. I don't know if yeah, that's Lily. That's good. And maybe just um, also emphasizing that um, myself, the team here on the COP28 side, but also UNEP and the Cool Coalition were available for any bilateral consultations and also if there were some questions on the pledge text itself that we could help perhaps clarify with a view of having uh, endorsements uh, by COP28. Uh, so that's something I wanted to add here. Looking at the other questions, and we're nearly at time. I think an important question from Ayman, uh, who's a colleague, and uh, more like a suggestion, which I think is a good one, that if some, he's saying that there's a lot of, I mean, for context, uh, I don't know, Ayman, if he's, yeah, we're all muted. Ayman yeah. is, um, uh, he's he's heading in uh, our, le our um, office in, in Saudi Arabia, and um, he's uh, was previously heading partnerships in the, in the Ozone Action, uh, team at, at UNEP. Um, and what he's put here is that um, they're been discussing with various countries in the, in the Middle East and ministers um, yes, yeah. and that there is acceptance in, of the pledge, uh, but there just is the need to do a lot of um, that's, that's process. Really, really. Yeah, I think that I that's think exactly that's what I was speaking to. I think it would be good, therefore, we would be available to, to engage bilaterally and hopefully be able to clarify to get those endorsements on time because um, uh, this is the, this is really the mom momentum we now have and we want to build on and we don't want to lose out on the opportunity uh, to have a strong pledge with uh, many endorsements uh, certainly uh, secured. Great. So, Looking through the other list of questions, there were, if you can, Lily, help me also scan through there if you if you saw saw any questions that we might not have yet um, answered. I mean, there's something on passive cooling. I think there, um, the, just to mention, we include nature in the definition of passive cooling. Um, so, and um so happy to further that discussion um what else is there deepa and clement can you please let in rahma i think he's in the virtual lobby waiting to join lily there's a question from studio which might be relevant in the q a for other people to hear the answer I think I already answered that one. Okay. If I'm not mistaken, I'll double check and see it. I think, yeah, I answered that. Um, so, just checking with Clement, Deepa, if you see Rama, some, I'll show you. Yeah, Rama doesn't have the good link. I'm going to share it with him. All right, perfect. Good. Please, do, yes. Keep the questions coming. Meanwhile, we'll have a uh, Rahma is also from the COP28 energy transition team and has been a key member in in working on the cooling agenda for COP. Uh, since so I think I see some questions from the private sector, like what additional commitments will we make to further enhance our efforts? So I think this is a question from Parissa. I don't know which company, but uh, just to answer, I think. Uh, it's it's about consolidating the support that you're providing to help countries achieve their commitments. So, for example, if you're working a lot on urban areas, um, it would be great to have, you know, your support specifically related to commitments that are touching on urban areas. And that would be something that you could indicate, you know, that maybe you scale up those efforts. Um, I see that a hand has risen. I don't know if, if that answers your question. Um, I don't know if you, I think microphones are muted. I don't know. My colleagues are taking care of that. But if it wasn't answered, please do put more in the chat or jump Good. in. I, yeah, no, let's use the chat function. I'm happy to, there was a hand raised here. Please feel free to reach out directly to me and Lily after the call if we're not able to answer your questions. Rahma, I think we should be able to get Rahma on the screen uh, now. Just also, I want to just say something on the countries that have signed. I think there's a bunch of countries that have been in the contact group that Mikhail mentioned, and those countries are all putting forward the pledge for um, signature. 
Uh, so um, I think that's about 13. Mikael, I don't know if you wanted to add anything there. Yeah, I'm trying to <laughs> sort out the technicalities here to to we live in this team's world for for many years now but yeah. it's still uh, still uh, sometimes it's a bit challenging and I wanted really to to use the last few minutes to let Rahma speak a bit more uh, give the UAE angle uh, having Process. been very closely involved uh, okay mm -mm -mm. um So in terms of government engagement in the in the pledge, um, should I answer that, Miguel? Do you want to answer that? No, There's a question ahead, on, yeah. Yeah. on the on the processes. So I mean, COP twenty eight. Did you want to answer that, or did you want? Please go ahead. Please go ahead. So on the processes uh, that that COP twenty eight. Presidencies followed to make sure there's participation of governments has evolved um, since January, a, a continued set of consultations that have been held, um, including at different fora. So because COP28 is trying to link across agendas, for example, the OEWG to the, the open-ended working group meeting of the Montreal Protocol was used to have a yeah. consultation uh, and all countries were invited to that. Uh, in that setting, and similarly in all of the regional climate weeks, and similarly through the G20, and similarly also through the coalition's own countries and other um, partners, such as, for example, um, CCAC or um, uh, IRENA also. Uh, there's been yes. consul uh, consultations with all the different governments. Yeah. Thanks, Lily. Thanks, Lily. And uh, now, finally, thank you, Rahma. <laughs> We got the technicalities sorted out, so so great to have you join. Uh, the floor is yours. I'll mute. Yeah, thank you, Mikael, um, Lily, and, and UNEP colleagues. Um, apologies, I wasn't able to uh, attend this session from the beginning, but as I'm sure everyone can understand, we're approaching the less than three week mark now to to COP28. So we, we, we are splitting responsibilities as much as possible. Um, but I wanted to make sure to join this session, number one, to, to thank all of the attendees here, um, as well as the, the UNEP team who we've been working um, for nearly uh, over a year now um, on this Global Cooling Pledge. Um, it's, it's a very important initiative that the COP28 presidency takes very seriously, and it's something that we've been pushing forward um, throughout all of the different consultations. Um, we've been, I think, pretty much all over the world now um, trying to rank up um, support for this uh, due to the importance that, that we definitely see. Um, coming from the, the UAE, which is, of course, a very high ambient temperature country, um, you know, the, the importance of cooling moving forward, not just for decarbonization, but also in terms of... Um, in terms of the ability uh, for for the world to be able to to handle what's what's coming, so I'd like to reiterate the points that my colleagues have been making throughout this call in terms of the importance of this pledge, um, and we would like to invite all of the countries to be able to sign on to this and endorse it in time for COP28. Again, this is something that is uh, very important for the presidency. Um, it's very important for the world as well in order to, to decarbonize and to ensure sustainable cooling is available for all. Um, so again, I'd like to reiterate my colleagues' um, call to action for this important sector and to invite all of you to be able to join us at COP28 for the launch of this pledge. Um, so with that, again, I'd like to thank you all for taking the time to, to listen to us um, and we hope to be able to count on your support uh, for this very important uh, initiative that we're working on. Thank you very much. Many thanks, Rahma. Many thanks. So that brings us one minute to the closure of this session. There's another one being planned for uh, later today, also to allow participants who might still be sleeping to join. Uh, so we're looking forward to tuning into that channel in a, in a matter of hours. 
So I think at this point also from my end, then it's a big thank you all for uh, joining today. And uh, please do reach out if you have any further questions, clarifications that you need. And we really uh, look forward to and really counting on you all and for your support in making sure that we get as many countries as possible to sign up and endorse this pledge. The momentum is now the point uh, is now to take action on this. So, so really, that's something that uh, we want to do with you. Lily, over for some closing remarks to you. No closing remarks after that. I think you and and uh, you and Rama did a, a great job uh, wrapping up the session. So just thank you to all, and um, please be in touch with any questions um, that remain unanswered. See you at COP. See you at COP. Yes. Thank you very much, everyone. Bye bye. Bye bye. We look we look forward to having you all. Thank you.